I'm so glad you're joining us. My name is Yvonne Valencourt. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are a facility of UMass Boston managed by the School for the Environment. And um, we sit on 107 acres on Nantucket owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. We run classes and we support researchers who come to Nantucket, not only people from the UMass system, but also people from other universities, institutions, and agencies. Um, it is my uh, distinct pleasure today uh, to have this webinar and to, and to introduce to you our speaker. Um, I also want to point out before I do that, uh, joining us and why you're seeing three faces is that uh, Leo Stella is assisting me in running this webinar and he will handle the questions and answer period, which will follow the, the talk by Jen Bowen. And um, Jennifer Bowen is a professor at Northeastern University. Her lab is at the Marine Science Center in Nahant, Massachusetts. Uh, Jen is a microbial ecologist, is that? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, and she's been studying uh, the dynamics of salt marshes, among many other things, um, since her PhD at Boston University. And prior to Boston University, she was at Colby. Um, and so her CV is rather lengthy with uh, many publications on themes that are very pertinent to Nantucket, where we are very concerned about our water quality. Um, we have marshes, a, a range of marshes in different stages of um, near pristine to some with some dieback. So um, I will, uh, without any further ado, um, hand this over to Jen. Are you seeing my cover slide? Yes. Outstanding. All right. So let me just move that out of the way so I can see what I'm doing. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. And um, thank you for having me. I, uh, I am a little bit sad to be doing this virtually because it would be lovely to come out to Nantucket. But, you know, I guess we all have to wait till, till we get some more shots in arms and we get everybody vaccinated before those times roll around. So, um, so in lieu of that, I'm coming to you from my home in Melrose, Massachusetts, and today I'm going to tell you a story that weaves together decades of research on salt marshes, the ecosystem services that they provide, and how these critically important ecosystems and the microbes that are essential to their functioning are going to be responding to some global change drivers. Um, the work that I present is a synthesis of work both from my lab and as well as from other labs. Um, and a lot of the work that comes out of my lab was done by uh, graduate students of mine, and I will highlight uh, their efforts as I go along. Um, and lastly, before I, before I go too far, I just want to acknowledge the funding sources that um, paid for some of this research, including grants from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, uh, the NOAA Sea Grant Organization, as well as startup funds from Northeastern University. Let's see. So let me start with a roadmap of what we're going to talk about, and I will refer back to this so that you can track along with where I am as I'm going. So I'll begin today by introducing probably what may be familiar to a lot of you, which are the ecosystem services that are provided by salt marshes. I'll talk a little bit about challenges that are facing both salt marshes specifically and coastal waters more generally. Many of these are themes that are, you're probably all struggling with out on Nantucket. In particular, I'm going to spend some time focusing on the nitrogen problem. Um, and, and in addition to parameterizing what that nitrogen problem is, I'll also discuss how microbes are helping us to combat those problems. As Yvonne mentioned, I'm a microbial ecologist, so I really like to study the details of the little things, but, but apply them to the much broader ecosystem scale processes that we're concerned about. Um, I'll transition from sort of briefly describing how microbes are helping us all to talking about how we need to be um, considering the different forms of nitrogen in the environment and the role that they play in our understanding of ecosystems and ultimately end with the importance of this understanding for marsh stability. So that's sort of um, the, the nuts and bolts of where we're gonna go through our talk today. And I'm gonna begin by talking about ecosystem services provided by marshes. So as I was preparing for this talk, um, I wanted to start close to home. So, uh, so this is a photo that I found on the internet, thank you internet, um, of Folgers Marsh. Uh, it was taken by Nantucket-based, whoops, Nantucket-based photographer Kit Noble. 
And I just think it's a really great photo because it gives such a, a, a beautiful perspective of the colors of the marsh, the sinuous channels that, that uh, interweave through it. And although I've only ever been to the Nantucket Field Station once, I did have uh, the ability to spend some time tromping around in Folgers Marsh. And it's really quite a spectacular place. Um, and, and this highlights some of the um, sort of important uh, cultural services that are provided by salt marshes, right? Perhaps some of you have had the opportunity to go kayaking through some of these channels or to poke around in the ponds and see what fishes are there. Uh, or even to just stop and take in the stunning view of the marsh with the, with the uh, harbor in the background. Um, so marshes provide a lot of essential services um, and, and cultural services, the services that I consider to be good for our soul are a really important one. They are places of respite, places to uh, walk away from the Zoom world that we're currently in and just disconnect um, from our phones and connect to nature. So they provide a lot of important cultural services, but there are other ecosystem services that they provide too. Oh, another cultural service that I forgot to mention uh, is the service of education. So this is uh, me working out in uh, a marsh just north of Massachusetts, uh, no, excuse me, just north of Boston with a group of students and teaching the students about marsh ecology and the ecosystem services that marsh provide. Marshes are also critically important as habitat. There are a lot of commercial uh, fish and shellfish that depend on salt marshes for some or all of their life cycle, um, including these, uh, these fish here, which are important bait fish for, for example, um, striped bass, which is, a, which is a really important salt marsh uh, predator. They're also very valuable with regard to storm surge protection. So the, the marsh grasses are our first line of defense against um, storm surges and as storms come ashore. And as we continue to warm our atmosphere and increase the storminess of our coasts, this role will, of salt marshes and storm surge protection will only continue to grow. The last thing that I want to mention briefly are, uh, is that salt marshes are really important for nutrient removal, right? And so um, this is an ecosystem service that marshes are known for. Uh, they intercept nutrients that are coming from land before they get to sea. But what we are less aware of um, are, the, are how much nutrients, how much nitrogen a marsh is able to absorb. And we'll talk more about that in the future. And then the last ecosystem service that I wanna mention is the service of carbon storage. And so marshes are extremely productive grassland ecosystems. You can see this here by the sea of green grasses behind in, in, this, in this picture. Uh, this is the Great Marsh uh, taken from uh, the, the north coast of Massachusetts up near the New Hampshire border. Um, and you can see that the, there is a huge amount of primary productivity that happens in these marshes. And a lot of that primary productivity stays in the marsh and accretes the marsh through this buildup of marsh peat. And in this marsh peat, you can see all the roots and rhizomes of the marsh um, that have been buried over time. And it turns out that that salt marshes bury a lot of organic matter. And so this is one, they are one component of the blue carbon ecosystem uh, that, that are storing carbon from the atmosphere. And the thought is that collectively these ecosystems can help us offset some of the carbon dioxide that we're releasing through the burning of fossil fuels. So what this figure is showing is carbon burial rate on the uh, y-axis in a bunch of different habitats on the x-axis. And note that this is a log scale. So there's a log folds change between each of, these, um, each of these increments. And what you can see is that salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses, the three blue carbon habitats, store an order of magnitude more carbon than thing things that we think of as being really good carbon sinks, like terrestrial forests, boreal forests, and tropical forests. So marshes are really important both because of their capacity to remove nitrogen and because of the carbon that they store. And those are the two ecosystem services that I'm going to focus this, the rest of this talk on. So we know that, that there are a host of really important ecosystem services provided by marshes, but marshes are also under threat from, a numer uh, from numerous different directions. Uh, this figure from um, uh, Bromberg and Burtness in 2005 shows the percent of marsh loss on the y-axis in each, of the, in, in each of the coastal New England states. Uh, and you see that Rhode Island has a very high rate of loss. Over 50% of marshes are estimated to be lost in Rhode Island. It's 41% in Massachusetts, 18% in New Hampshire. According to them, zero in Maine, although as of 
born and raised Mainer, I'm sure that that's 100% not true. They probably just don't have very good data. But overall, they estimate that the total loss of marshes in New England is around 37%. And 25% of marsh, marsh area has been lost globally since the 1800s. So we're losing marsh habitat at a time when we're also beginning to recognize how critically important these habitats are for a host of ecosystem services. And we're losing them both to habitat destruction, but also to the spread of invasive species. So what you see here is a Phragmites australis, which is an invasive reed um, that is, that is uh, growing into marshes in many environments, um, including I think in some of the marshes on Nantucket. Of course, sea level rise is going to be a huge challenge for, for marshes to, uh, to, to, to deal with. Um, as sea levels have risen historically, marshes have been able to migrate with sea level rises. So through glacial periods, as waters receded, marshes would, would move seaward with them. And as sea levels rose, marshes would move landward. Um, the, and dictated by competition from the upland border. So they can grow in salty areas where other plants can't grow. And so as, as sea levels, as, as salt water intrusion wipes out upland vegetation, salt marsh is able to move in. But the rate at which sea levels are rising right now is, is considerably, is, is fast relative to historical rates. And so it remains a question whether they're going to be able to continue to move with, with uh, sea levels as they continue to rise. Urban development exacerbates that problem because we've hardened our shorelines. And so, you know, even if this, these marshes here were able to migrate with sea levels as they rise and fall, they can't migrate against a cement wall. And so urban development has, has combined with sea level rise is threatening to drown a, a lot of our coastal marshes. And another big perturbation that I've mentioned is the role of nutrients. And so, and nutrients, increasing nutrient supply to marshes um, has been perceived to be relatively unimportant historically because marshes are able to absorb a lot of the nutrients that are added. But it remains to be seen whether there is a limit to that capacity or not. And that's what I'm gonna focus a lot of my research on today. And the reason that I'm gonna focus my research on this today is because nutrient enrichment around the world is largely increasing. So what I'm showing you here today is, is this figure is from Deegan et al in 2012. And what I want you to look at are the warm colors. And so what these warm colors are, are, um, increase, are showing increases in nutrient enrichment relative to pre-industrial times, whereas the cool colors are showing decreases in nutrient enrichment relative to pre-industrial times. And what you can see, not surprisingly, is that, that all of these watersheds in red are showing an increase in nutrient flux from watersheds to, towards the coastal ocean. And if you overlay upon that these, uh, a, a map of where all of the major salt marshes are in the world, you can see that many of these salt marshes are in areas where there is an increase in nutrient enrichment. And so we want to try and understand how this nutrient enrichment is going to alter um, our, our marshes going forward and whether they can be used to help marshes keep pace with sea level rise or whether they're going to inhibit the capacity of marshes to keep pace with sea level rise. So to dig in on that, I want to I want to be sure that we're all on the same page and I want to introduce you to the idea of Liebig's law of the minimum. So so this was an idea that was originally described by the German chemist Justice von Liebig in the late 1800s. And prior to Justice von Liebig, the, the conventional wisdom was that plants would grow to the amount that, what, that was equivalent to the sum of all of the resources that they had available to them. So you can think of this using this barrel analogy as the sum of all of these slats. But, but Justice von Liebig realized that in fact, it wasn't the total amount of resource that was available that dictated how much plants grow. It was the, the, ex, the, the least abundant resource and the amount of the least abundant resource. And this barrel sort of indicates this where you know that a barrel can only hold as much water as, is, is, as the lowest slat the, and then the water leaks out. And that is same as the tr is true for plant growth. The, the, the most limiting nutrient is what prevents um, plants from growing bigger. This is why we add fertilizer to our gardens and to our houseplants and to our lawns, because we're trying to relieve the nutrient limitation 
um, and increase plant growth. And in most coastal systems, nitrogen is the nutrient that is, is most often limiting. And so, and so adding nitrogen to the environment as we are uh, is, is certainly critically important for understanding um, how our coastal systems are gonna respond um, to this increase. Nitrogen is not, uh, is not new, it's not uh, it different. It's been around for a very long time. It accounts for 78% of our atmosphere. But this nitrogen gas molecule is a very difficult molecule to split apart. There's a lot of energy holding those two, those two atoms together. And so prior to about the turn of the 20th century, the only organisms on earth that could split the, that molecule apart were bacteria. As a microbial ecologist, I wanna highlight their important role because, because without them, we would have much lower amounts of primary productivity in the world. And these are just some of the really common, uh, both marine and terrestrial nitrogen fixers that they're called. And so you're probably all familiar with legumes, soy um, and peas and beans. And in these plants, they have um, nodules that contain nitrogen fixing bacteria and they, this mutualistic relationship has the bacteria fixing nitrogen for the plant and then using carbohydrates produced by the plant to support their growth. In the marine realm, there are, are uh, cyanobacteria, or, uh, nitrogen fixers like trichodesmium and NASDAQ, um, all that have evolved different mechanisms for, uh, for fixing nitrogen. But all of these different bacteria sort of became a little bit obsolete when these two guys came along. Um, these guys uh, are Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch, and these two gentlemen collectively are responsible for doing what all of these bacteria used to do. Well, and they still do this, but these guys do it a lot more, um, to, to doing what these bacteria used to do. So they figured out how to fix nitrogen out of thin air. Um, Fritz Haber was the chemist who figured this out, and he uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1918, and Carl Bosch was um, the industrialist who figured out how to scale this process up. Um, and, and, and make, it, make it efficient. And he also won the Nobel Prize. So how do they do this? The first step in this is they generate hydrogen gas from methane um, and using catalysts, metal catalysts, and a lot of pressure and uh, high temperatures. And then once they have this hydrogen gas, they can combine it also under high pressure and temperature with nitrogen gas to create this molecule here of ammonium. And this is arguably one of the most important inventions of the 20th century because they were able to use this ammonium to form fertilizers, um, which we all know are essential to crop production and food security in the world today. In fact, 40 to 50% of the world's population depends on food grown with fertilizers produced by the Haber-Bosch process. So, this is a really, really important uh, discovery. It, it is also worth pointing out that they were not altruistic humans and they did not do this to feed the world. They did this to aid the German war effort because this nitrogen is also incredibly important for building bombs. And prior to this invention, the best way to get enough nitrogen for bombs was to use bird guano. So, so their, 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 their efforts, well, while ultimately helping feed the world, we're not, we're not altruistic. But they have changed the planet. Um, and in particular, they've changed the planet since the end of World War II. So what I'm showing you here is uh, the increase in nitrogen fixation and CO2 relative to levels that were set in 1961. So that's what this line here is, the relative, of the, the, um, the relative amount of each of these processes in 1961. And in light blue, you have the amount of nitrogen from fertilizers. In orange, you have the amount of nitrogen from, um, fix, from emissions, from the combustion of fossil fuels. And in blue here, you have the amount of nitrogen in crops. So this is the amount of nitrogen that's grown in crops that produce a lot of nitrogen, like legumes and, and rice. And as you can see, all of these are increasing, but, but nitrogen fertilization is increasing the most. And that increase started after World War II and has been steadily increasing ever since. And in fact, relative to the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the amount of end fertilizer increase has, is, uh, at, relative to 1961 proportions, it's increasing even faster than the amount of CO2. So we are adding a lot of nitrogen to the planet and it is harming our coastal waters. And people on Nantucket I, are probably dealing with a lot of this in their harbor, and it's uh, an issue 
in lots of places. So let's look at what it's doing to our coastal systems. The Haber-Bosch process increases the amount of fixed nitrogen that's on the planet and that exists in the world. That nitrogen, because it relieves nutrient limitation, does so in our agricultural fields, but when it gets in our coastal waters, it increases the abundance of algal, it causes algal blooms, increases the abundance of macroalgae and phytoplankton. And if there aren't enough grazers there to keep those blooms under control, then you get an excess buildup of these different primary producers, phytoplankton and macroalgae. If they're not consumed, then that organic matter decays and our bacteria come back into the picture here because it's the bacteria that are responsible for that or organic matter decomposition. And when they do that, they consume oxygen from the environment, developing areas where there's no oxygen or very low oxygen in the water, which can ultimately lead to fish kills. So this is sort of the classic eutrophication cycle that happens under highly enriched uh, systems. And uh, this is a problem locally. This is, I did a lot of work in McCoit Bay on Cape Cod in Falmouth when I was in graduate school. And this is a particularly um, uh, robust algal bloom in McCoit Bay. Oops, in McCoit Bay, you can see how much it extends off the beach. You can see how much algae is washed up on the beach here. And you can see what a pain it is to try and row a boat through, um, through, that, through that mass of algae. It is also uh, has this, this eutrophication has negative consequences for seagrass beds and the organisms that depend on them, in particular the bay scallop, which I know is a, is a, um, a critically important Nantucket uh, uh, fishery. And so in, in, this, in these seagrass systems, you, if you have phytoplankton blooming or if you have um, macroalgae that attaches to the seagrass, all of these things end up decreasing the amount of light that reaches the bottom. Um, which limits the ability of seagrasses to grow because they need the light for photosynthesis. And as nutrients take out, uh, um, uh, take out these seagrasses, ultimately um, the, the critical organisms that depend on them also go away. So this is a critical problem on a, in a lot of Cape Cod estuaries, um, but it's also a national problem. So this figure was taken from the NOAA National Estuarine Eutrophication Assessment and it's showing uh, estuaries around the world and the degree of uh, eutrophication. So this is number of estuaries on the y-axis and in, in these warm colors, yellow, orange, and red are estuaries that were rated to have moderate to high degrees of eutrophication. Whereas the blue and greens are in low or, low or moderately low uh, degrees of eutrophication. So you can see that around the country, there are estuaries that have moderate, moderately high or high degrees of eutrophication. So this issue of nutrient loading is not just a Cape Cod issue, it's a national problem. And in fact, it's even a global problem. This figure, each of these red dots shows an area where there is uh, at, at least periodic anoxia that forms in the waters as a result of nutrient supply. And so you can see that around the world, estuaries are struggling with nutrient over enrichment and the resulting um, low oxygen or no oxygen waters that result. So we know that there's a nitrogen problem. Um, and, and, and I wanna sort of look in a little bit more detail at what, that, at what that nitrogen problem is. So these guys figured out how you could make, how you could make fixed nitrogen out of, out of thin air, out of nitrogen gas but they never figured out how to do the reverse process. So there's no industrial analog for taking fixed nitrogen from the environment and turning it back into nitrogen gas. Um, the only things that we know of that can do this are bacteria and, and, and in particular, the bacteria that live in salt marshes are particularly important at this. And we have some, some circumstantial evidence of this. Um, by looking at the, the role that wetlands play in protecting our seagrass beds as a function of nitrogen load. So in this first figure, what I'm showing is the amount of nitrogen being added into estuaries from a whole bunch of different estuary systems. And, I'm look, and on the y-axis is the amount of seagrass that gets lost as a result of that. And as you can see, over the first 200 or so kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, you see an increasing loss of seagrasses. And by the time you get up here to these higher nitrogen loads, you don't see, these estuaries don't even have seagrass beds anymore. They've already been lost. But when you plot these same estuaries as a function of 
the total, the percentage of the estuary that's wetland. So that's, this is what the x-axis is. So here, 60% of the estuary area is wetland. Here, 0% is wetland. Um, and wetland here is both salt marshes and mangroves that are included in this study. And you can see that the amount of seagrass that gets lost decreases the more, with the more wetland area you have. So this suggests that there's something happening in wetlands that are helping to protect adjacent seagrass um, beds. And when we look at some place like Nantucket and downtown Nantucket, we can see how critically important marshes like this one are. Because nitrogen that's going to be leaving land from runoff or from septic systems, if these are on septic systems, I, or, or from, from uh, lawns and gardens and that kind of thing, are going to run off from the land and enter the marsh. And, and the marsh, and in particular the microbes that live in the marsh, are able to do that exact reverse process of what the Haber-Bosch method does. They're able to take that nitrogen that's fixed and usable by primary producers and put it back into the atmosphere as nitrogen gas before it can get out into the harbor and cause um, the negative consequences of eutrophication. So, that's sort of the nitrogen problem, and microbes are going to be able to help us uh, solve this problem. And so I want to go through a little bit about how they do that. Um, and, and in particular about why we need to care about the microbes that live in our salt marshes. So it turns out that although we don't think about the role that microbes play in ecosystem services very often, in fact their metabolisms are really important to some of the ecosystem services that we think a lot about. And I think that this picture, that, which was taken by my former graduate student, Chris Lynham, uh, really em encapsulates a huge amount about what's going on in a salt marsh um, metabolism. So you have photosynthesis happening, right? You're, you have organisms that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, fixing it into biomass. Uh, you have marsh plants that do this, just like the plants in your garden and in your house and, and every other plant that exists is doing. And you also have cyanobacteria, these green mats here that are also, um, that are also fixing uh, carbon dioxide. But marshes are really cool because you have other bacteria, like these purple sulfur bacteria, they can also fix carbon dioxide, but they, they don't use water, they use the sulfide, that rotten egg smell that's coming from the marsh, they use that um, to, to fix uh, carbon dioxide rather than than these guys, which need water to do that. So both of these, oh, and then you also have uh, decomposition happening, right? And so you can see this outline here of a leaf um, and the, the outline of the leaf and the ribs of the leaf are still intact. Those um, represent harder to digest carbon for bacteria, but then all of, this, all of the material in between the leaves, all that juicy, delicious leaf material um, has been decomposed already. And so you see examples both of autotrophy, this, uh, this carbon fixation that's happening by plants and microbes um, in the salt marsh. And you can see all of these uh, decomposition processes, these heterotrophic processes where bacteria are using organic matter that's already in the marsh for energy. Um, and it's this, these heterotrophic processes that I wanna focus on a little bit. So, um, I'm only going to give you a little bit more chemistry, I promise, but I want to just walk through um, each, of these, each of these steps because it's important to understand that really bacteria aren't so different um, from, from you and me. So I had a salad for lunch today, and basically what that was was organic matter. That's what is this, this is representative of organic matter. And the oxygen that I breathe every day helps me to metabolize that organic matter. And I respire that and I generate energy, right? That's the basic idea of respiration. And that's exactly what bacteria do. Um, and so in salt marshes, that, that um, organic matter comes from a bunch of different sources, but primarily from the roots and rhizomes and plants of the, um, and of the marsh plants. And technically we refer to that as an electron donor. Um, that organic material, the bagel that I ate for breakfast, the salad that I, that I have for lunch, they're donating electrons to help respiration occur. And then this respiration also requires an electron acceptor, right? And for us, that's oxygen. We breathe that oxygen and that makes this reaction happen um, to generate energy. And the reason that bacteria are so cool 
is because they don't need oxygen to do that. They can use nitrate. They can use nitrogen in this form, NO3, instead of oxygen. And, to, and in doing that, they generate N2 gas. So this is that step that reverses the Haber-Bosch process. They take this nitrogen that is, that is available for primary producers to use, and instead they send it back to the atmosphere before it can cause harm to, to coastal waters. Um, and this is a process called denitrification. So microbes are reversing the Haber-Bosch process, returning nitrogen back to the atmosphere as inert nitrogen gas. And in so doing, they are, uh, they are helping to ameliorate the pollution from nitrogen on land. And bacteria and salt marshes are able to do this because oxygen is in pretty short supply in, in marsh sediments. So if there's plenty of oxygen around, bacteria will choose to use that instead because they get more energy from using oxygen than from nitrate. But nitrate is second best. So if there's no oxygen around, they will use this instead for their, for their respiration. So microbes are really important because they are able to reverse this Haber-Bosch process. But it's also important to recognize that not all nitrogen is created equal. And so for most of this talk, I've just been talking about nitrogen generally. But there are actually a really important distinctions that we need to make on the different types of nitrogen. So the Haber-Bosch process takes nitrogen gas and it fixes it into ammonia. Ammonia, uh, when it is dissolved in water, has this form here, ammonium. And so when people go out and measure water quality, ammonium is one of the things that is often measured. Now, in the presence of oxygen, there are other bacteria that will take that ammonium and they will convert it to nitrate, right? And this is a really important step because it's this nitrate that is that can have multiple different fates, right? The nitrate and the ammonium both can be used to support primary production to increase um, plant biomass, but the nitrate can also be used in this denitrification process that I just described. So this is ammonium can be used to support plants um, and primary production in nitrogen limited systems, but nitrate has two different roles that it can play. It can support primary producers, or it can be oxidized by, or it can be um, reduced by the microbes living in the sediment to create nitrogen gas. So let's take a step back now and think about what this, this, this crash course in microbial metabolisms means for our understanding of coastal ecosystems. So, what I'm, so when we add ammonium to a, to a salt marsh, that ammonium can be used as a nutrient and it can support primary production because coastal salt marshes are nitrogen limited. So if we add ammonium, we're going to increase, um, most research shows that we're going to increase um, plant growth. And in doing that, we're gonna store more organic carbon. We're gonna allow marshes to trap, that, that increased growth, growth will increase sediment trapping and will allow marshes to continue to build elevation relative to, um, to, to sea levels. However, if we add nitrogen as ammonia, as nitrate, excuse me, um, it can do this as well. It could, if it takes this path, also support primary production and organic carbon storage. But if it takes this path, if it's used as an electron acceptor for microbial respiration, then it's gonna be taking the organic matter that's there in the marsh and using that, just like I use my salad for lunch and my bagel for breakfast, and using that for respiration and producing CO2 as, as a byproduct. So the consequences of these two actions for our marshes are important. This pathway builds elevation and allows marshes to store carbon. And this pathway would, would take the organic matter that's already there in the marshes and use that um, to, as, to decompo and, and decompose that further and convert it back to, to carbon dioxide. So the question is, which one of these things um, is, is most important? And I'm just going to show a little bit of data that we have um, that, that discusses that question. So here's, um, I'm going to contrast two different experiments that um, I've worked on over the years. The first one is uh, from, from uh, the Great Sipwisset Marsh. So uh, fertilization of this salt marsh began in, the, in 1971. Um, so this marsh has been fertilized for longer than I have existed. Um, and, and it's a remarkable experiment that, uh, that have, has 
dozens of papers, hundreds probably of papers have been published studying the effect of nutrients on every different component of this marsh system. But I think in the interest of a picture, um, a picture is worth a thousand words, this, this image really shows the effect of that, of that long-term nutrient enrichment. So what you see here in the foreground and in the background is sort of a typical marsh would look like in, in the fall of the year. This is probably exactly what Folgers Marsh looks like um, in the fall. But here in the middle is one of the highly fertilized plots um, that, that has been fertilized since the early 70s. And what you can see is that there's differences in vegetation. You have encroachment of woody shrubs. You have, it, it's super green. The elevation of the marsh is higher. Um, it, it appears to be doing what we suggested, that the vegetation is trapping more sediments and building more biomass relative to the rest of the marsh. But we can contrast this with another uh, salt marsh study that I was involved in, where, where marshes on the North Shore up in Plum Island um, were, were, were fertilized, for also for many years, uh, as a part of the research going on at the Plum Island Ecosystems Long-Term Ecological Research Site in uh, Ipswich and Rowley, Massachusetts. Excuse me. And in this paper, they also looked at how the plants responded to, to nutrient additions. And they report only a mild response, no increase in above ground biomass, like you see here in this picture, and no consistent response to nutrient enrichment. So, so in, a, in addition, not only did they not see a, a strong response to the plants, but they did see a strong negative response of that nutrient enrichment, not on the plants, but on the marsh itself. And that's what this figure here is showing. So in the top, I have, I'm have i showing pictures of a, a, a reference marsh that received no nutrient enrichment. And it, this probably looks like the marshes that you're familiar with. You have these nice channels that are, that are kind of clear. They've got uh, vegetation growing right along the edges of them. When the tide is out, you see this nice mud bank with these nice, um, these nice clearly defined um, uh, cliffs of, of grass and mud. But in the nutrient enriched marsh, we saw something entirely different. We started to see these cracks forming along the edges of the marsh. We started to see areas where the marsh was sort of collapsing in and caving into the marsh creeks. And the difference in, this, in, the, in the collapse, the number of collapses in this creek versus this is really quite stark. And, and the authors of the study concluded that uh, nutrient levels decreased below ground biomass of bank stabilizing roots. So they decreased the, the biomass of the plants along the edge underground that held the marsh together. And they increased microbial decomposition of organic matter, which led to kind of the collapse of this marsh. So we have two really distinct responses. We have sort of marsh starting to collapse when nutrients are added to it in this example. And in the previous example, we have that really lush green vegetation um, and an increase in elevation as a response to nutrients. So we really wondered what was causing the difference between these two, uh, these two systems. And we can, just, we can think about it, um, and I, hopefully you see where this is going by the different forms of nitrogen um, that are added and the importance of these different forms. But, but that's sort of what I wanna point out here. So, these are the sequoia marsh plots, um, and in these in these marsh plots, nutrients were added every other week, but they were added directly to the marsh plot as pellets of fertilizer that were spread out over the marsh, and they had different concentrations. So they had a control, uh, a 10x background, a 30x background, and a 90x background. Right. So you had a range of concentrations of, of nitrogen, and that nitrogen was added as sewage sludge. So basically, as as the same kind of fertilizer that you would put on your lawns. In the other experiment, the one where we saw lots of marsh cracking, we added nitrate there only to 15 to 20 times background concentration. So in the lower end of this experiment, but we added it as nitrate that was dissolved in the flooding water. And the idea here was that as we continue to increase nutrient enrichment in our, in our coastal waters, it's not gonna be in the form of pelletized fertilizers that are added to the creek, it's, er, that are added to the marsh. It's gonna be in the form of enriched coastal waters. And so we wanted to try and mimic that. And so it's possible that these different forms of nitrogen are, are the reason why we saw those different responses. But there were a lot of things that were different about this experiment that don't allow us to say that completely, right? This, the, there were different concentrations, they were in different systems, there were lots of differences. But this supports our idea 
that potentially the form of nitrogen is something that we need to be paying attention to. I scoured the literature to see if there was any example of, of a direct comparison of when you add uh, ni nitrogen as ammonium or when you add it as nitrate. And this was the only study I could find from Mendelssohn in 1979. And what he did was in two different growth forms of Spartina alterniflora, he added nitrogen to the soils, both as uh, ammonium in light blue and nitrate in, well, I guess black. Um, and he did it at a bunch of different concentrations. And in both cases, you see that the, uh, the amount of the above ground biomass of the plant increased. So when you added ammonium. So the plants did better when you gave them ammonium than when you gave them nitrate. There are a lot of reasons why that could be. Could just be a physiological aspect of the plant. They don't have the right receptors to take up nitrate or ammonium. But it could also be that the bacteria are getting to the nitrate and using it as an electron acceptor instead for respiration first before the plants can get it. And that was the hypothesis that we, that we started to explore and that we published recently in a paper that just came out um, that has the same title as this talk, Not All Nitrogen is Created Equal. Um, and this is the, one, the reference marsh um, for the fertilization experiment up in Plum Island that we've been working on for years. So to explore this further, we started by doing a meta-analysis where we looked at um, a bunch of papers that have been published and asked the question, what kind of fertilizer did they add and how big was the response to that fertilizer addition? So we've broken these down here by ammonium, ammonium nitrate, so this added both, just nitrate, and, um, and uh, urea or fertilizer, organic end of some form. And we calculated the log response ratio, and what you need to know is that anything on this side of this dashed line means that the, uh, that the nutrient had an, a positive effect, and anything on this side means it had a negative effect. And what you can tell is that the preponderance of the points in all of these studies fall on the right-hand side of the dashed line, meaning that nutrients did stimulate primary productivity um, or in the form of above ground biomass, that's the metric here, um, but they didn't do it equally. And so when you average these up, you see that the that ammonium, ammonium nitrate and, and urea fertilizer all had much higher responses to the nutrient enrichment than nitrate did. So this is another line of evidence that suggests that there's something different when you add nitrate that's happening. And we hypothesized um, that it was that it was this form of nitrogen that we that we needed to care about, and this is where my grad student Ashley um, Volseco comes in. She developed some really cool experiments to test this. So she looked at uh, sediment from three different levels in a marsh. So in a typical marsh, you have a small amount of oxygen in the surface, but that gets used up really quickly. Um, you have some nitrate that's up there too, but that also gets used up really quickly. And then all of the rest of this uh, marsh, really the only, the best electron acceptor it has is this sulfate. And you also have a range in carbon quality, right? Because you have plants that are up here that are photosynthesizing and releasing a lot of fresh carbon. But over time, as that gets buried, it gets picked over by bacteria. Um, and so the quality of the carbon decreases with that. So she selected nitrate, she selected sediments from three different depths, representing three different degrees of carbon quality. And to half of them, she added nitrate. And to the other half, um, she added nothing. And she incubated them in, in, in this anaerobic chamber because there's no oxygen going on down here um, for 90 days. And she used these reactors to examine what, uh, what was changing as, the, as a result of transversing through the sediments. So there's an inflow of water here. And, and the water interacts with microbes that are in the sediment cores. And then there's an outflow here. And you can measure what's coming in and what's going out and look at the difference and attribute that difference to what the microbes are doing in these, in these uh, little vessels here. So what did she find? I'm gonna just very briefly highlight um, a, a sort of a synthesis of her results. And so um, these three figures all have the same structure. What I'm showing you on the y-axis is what we have written as DIC production. So this is a proxy for respiration. This is basically the amount of carbon dioxide produced by the microbes that are living in those little reactors and that are, um, <clears throat> that are decomposing organic matter and producing um, CO2. And then each of these is the duration of the experiment. She ran the experiment for 90 days. And then she had three salt marsh depths. So this is the shallow, the mid, and the deep water. 
And what you can see is that in yellow, which are the nitrate additions, she increased the amount of carbon um, that was being respired, the increased rate of the increase in respiration um, relative to areas where there was no when there was no nitrate added. And that was true at each depth. So regardless of how complex the carbon was, she was able to show that, uh, that, that adding nitrate stimulated decomposition. So this was pretty good indication that the, that the bacteria were actually able to use that nitrate. And maybe that is why they're out, maybe they are able to outcompete plants, which is why you see the, 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 the lesser response to plants when they are given nitrate. But we really wanted to, to nail that down a little bit. And this is where my grad student, Joe, comes in. So we did see this change in nitrate, but in order to ensure that it was really the, the bacteria that were doing it, Joe decided that he wanted to sequence the genomes of the bacteria and be sure that the genes that are responsible for these processes were present. So how did he do that? He took this giant mix of bacteria that were in, um, in, the, in the soils of those reactors and he, um, or, you know, that were in the, in, this, in the soils in the marsh and then that actually put into the reactors. They exposed some of them to nitrate, some they didn't expose. He sequenced both groups. Uh, and when you get these sequences, you get these tiny little strands of DNA, 150 bases long. Uh, but then you can assemble them all because if you sequence deeply enough, you can sort of stitch them all back together and map them into these longer stretches of DNA that we call contigs. And then you can put those contigs all together to reconstruct the genome of the bacteria in the environment. And so he was able to basically take the DNA from all of these guys, chop it up into little bits, mend it all back together, and recreate the genomes of the bacteria that were in the, that were in the experiment and see how they changed when they were exposed to nitrate and when they weren't. And what he showed was that, and, and there's a lot of complexity to these data, so I'm really just sort of distilling it down to the essential components for this talk, which are that in fact, in the nitrate enriched system, you see, uh, you see an increase in genes related to that denitrification process, that taking of the nitrate and converting it to nitrogen gas. And that's what these green bars here are here. Anything on this side of the zero line are higher in the plus nitrate treatment. Anything on this side are higher in the absence of nitrate. But our denitrification genes are all enriched when nitrate is added. And also our carbon use related genes, the genes for decomposing all of that organic matter are also all enriched when we add nitrate. So <clears throat> this, this part of our experiment indicates that adding nitrate um, in these marshes can promote decomposition of organic matter through stimulating this denitrification. That's really good if you wanna remove nitrate from your, uh, from, from your land pollution before it enters coastal waters but it does have consequences for the organic matter that is in the marsh. And so I'm gonna end by just talking a little bit, uh, briefly wrapping up about the importance of, of this long story about how oh, not all nitrogen is created equal and what that means for the stability of salt marshes. So Haber and Bosch figured out how to fix nitrogen. We have since used that and increased the amount of that tremendously this is both a blessing and a curse, right? It is a blessing because it has allowed us to feed many more people, but it is a curse because in excess, it has consequences, negative consequences for coastal systems, including economic consequences due to the loss of tourism, the loss of um, healthy shellfishing grounds, the loss of, of nursery grounds and so on, and, and, um, and the loss of seagrass beds. So we know that there are consequences for this nitrogen and our salt marshes are able to help us combat that. But we also know that salt marshes are facing a threat from, from sea level rise. And anything that in influences the ability of salt marshes to keep pace with sea level rise is, is exacerbating that threat. So we know now that as we add nitrogen to our coastal systems, depending on what form that nitrogen is, it may have negative consequences for, um, for the, our marsh sustainability. If we add it as ammonium, we may stimulate marsh plant growth, trap more sediments, and allow the marsh to keep pace with sea level. But if it's in the form of nitrate, then it may end up leading to more marsh cracking and slumping and, um, and less ability of the marsh to both store carbon and to keep pace with sea level rise. Whoops. 
um, which is what is what was shown by my grad student Ashley. Now, there are a lot of caveats um, to this work and some implications, and I just want to uh, leave you with with what some of those implications are and what future directions um, there, that we need to take before we really truly understand what this means for the sustainability of these coastal systems. First, um, we have to start paying attention that to not just the quantity, but also uh, the form of nitrogen that enters our coastal waters. We, I, we, we have definitively shown that ammonium and nitrate do very different things when they enter marshes, and we need to understand what is coming into our coastal systems and how it's being transformed um, if we want to be able to predict how future changes are going to affect our salt marshes. Um, we showed that although bacteria can use nitrate for respiration, we also do see that plants take it up. So I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that this is a, a, a one-size-fits-all sort of thing, right? Bacteria, some bacteria will still, will be able to take up that nitrate, but the plants are also getting it. And so we don't have a good idea yet how much this will actually slow the growth of salt marsh vegetation. And that's research that we have actively um, under, that we're actively undertaking now in direct comparison. When everything else is held equal, what is the difference in growth increment when you add ammonium versus nitrate? And what does that mean for trapping sediments and carbon storage? These are, these are questions that are still active. But this, uh, the fact that nitrate can be used by bacteria for respiration certainly suggests that we may be slowing the ability of marshes to, uh, to accumulate. Um, so this means that the plants might, might still be getting enough to keep pace with sea level rise, but they might not. And that's something that we need to do more research on. Um, and this is important because we have to understand exactly um, what this means for, the, for marsh survival and doing these future experiments will help us to parameterize that better. Um, lastly, this suggests that in marshes that are drowning due to sea level rise, we can start thinking about different methods that we can use to try and help save these marshes. So for example, if adding ammonium helps increase plant above ground biomass and sediment trapping, then that can potentially become part of our, our toolkit for helping marshes survive sea level rise. Of course, we don't want to add too much though because we want to be sure that it doesn't end up uh, causing downstream effects in our coastal waters. So we definitely need to do some more experiments to see, um, to see how much uh, we should be adding. But the bottom line is that our marshes are essential for protecting offshore waters, and in large part because of the microbes that live in their sediments. Um, and we need to think creatively about how to protect these salt marshes and their microbial residents as uh, sea levels continue to rise. Um, so I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, Yvonne, should I stop sharing my screen? Probably. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Jen. That was really interesting. Um, so we're at the question and answer period for uh, everyone attending. If you have a question, um, you can use the Q&A um, area that you should see um, on the frame of your, your Zoom box. And we, we um, have Leo Stella, who will be um, facilitating the question and answer period. So Leo, take it away. Sure. And thank you again, Jennifer. Um, we do already have a question here from Eugene Gallagher. The question is, how much N2 production is due to Animox, excuse me, and is Animox in the nitrate addition plot responsible for more N2 production than in the sewage addition? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, uh, a little, a little backstory. So uh, I talked a lot about this denitrification process where nitrate is being converted to nitrogen gas. There is another process in the nitrogen cycle that, that Eugene is referring to called Animox, which is short for anaerobic oxidation of ammonium. And so this is another process where, uh, where bacteria can use ammonium, which is the NH4 part, and another type of nitrogen called nitrite, NO2, and create nitrogen gas that way. I don't have a slide to show you or I would draw it out. Um, but so, so one of the key differences is that this animox, these animox bacteria are autotrophs. They're not heterotrophs. And so if that were the case, if, 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 if that, that would actually be a really good thing. If animox was what was getting rid of the 
the nitrogen and removing it back to N2 gas, it would be doing it and it wouldn't be decomposing the marsh to do it because they use that reaction. They take that ammonium and they use that nitrate and they use that for energy to fix carbon dioxide. So they work more like plants than like most bacteria do. So if animox were, were happening in these systems, we could be getting rid of our nitrogen that way and not decomposing the marsh in the process. Unfortunately, animox rates, when they have been measured in salt marshes are extremely low. Um, and in general, they tend to decrease with increasing organic matter abundance. Um, and I think it's just primarily the bacteria that do this animox reaction, they're really slow growing and kind of pokey. And so if there's organic matter around, um, then things that can outcompete them and divide more quickly can get access to um, the nutrients that they need uh, before the animox bacteria can. So um, a few different lab groups have measured animox in, in different wetlands, and it's almost always just a tiny, tiny, tiny part of, uh, of that N2 flux. Um, there is another process that um, is also a really cool one that we need to be paying more attention to, and that's called dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium. So this is like really nerdy nitrogen cycle stuff, but, but there are bacteria that can take that nitrate that I've been talking about, the NO3, and, and it can, instead of sending it to N2 gas, it can turn it back into ammonium. So where it can then be used by plants. So this is a system, this is a process where the marsh is able to actually hold on to its nitrogen rather than sending it back to the atmosphere. And there's still a lot of work to be done to try and understand the partitioning between um, denitrification and, and DNRA, that nitrate reduction ammonium. Um, but so far most, it, most studies have shown that it's, it's primarily denitrification and maybe 20% or so of, of the other process. Um, and in Ashley's reactors, we actually did measure that and that was about the ratio in those reactors. It was about 80% denitrification and 20% um, DNRA. Great, thank you. Um, Eugene, I hope that answered your question and more. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to pop it in the Q&A chat. Um, in the meantime, I suspect that Yvonne has a question or two, not to put you on the spot. I do. Um, thank you, Leo. Yeah, I, I have more than one question. So if you don't want to listen to me, you guys better come up with some more questions. <laughs> um, it, it, there's so many questions. So, you know, we think of the runoff from fertilizer here and, and talk about it as, as a really bad thing because we're so scared of the eutrophication. And when you listen to this, um, you can begin to think, well, it sounds like we're, you know, sounds like the opposite if you're just sort of listening at the surface, I guess. Um, in, in that, uh, so I was thinking, how do you apply this um, in, a, in the uh, kind of basic way? I mean, do you, could you make some sort of system where water filters through a series of containers, almost like a microbial filtration system where they can do the work for you? And I mean, is that actually something people think about or how do we apply this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I think, so I definitely don't want people to walk away from this talk thinking like, oh, actually we want nutrients in our water they're really good because we know all of the deleterious effects that come from over enrichment with nutrients, right? And so, um, and so marshes are really, really helpful at, at helping to solve that problem, but, but certainly they're not, there's not enough marsh in most systems to really offset the, the nutrient pollution that's coming from fertilizers and that sort of thing. Um, and so, um, preserving and conserving the marshes that you have uh, is really important. Restoring marshes where they have become degraded to create more habitat to act as this sort of living filter is a really important thing to do. Um, and, you know, if you knew of areas, so, so what do bacteria need to be able to do this, to be able to remove this nitrogen? It's just like what we need. We need, uh, we need food, right? They need food and, and they need to have um, in this case, they need not very much oxygen around because 
if there's oxygen there, they're going to use that instead. And so salt marshes are perfect because there's a ton of food and there's not very much oxygen. And so creating habitats where that's the case will, in theory, help um, remove nutrients. And there are lots of examples of, of ways that people do that. So um, in the Midwest, farmers put, um, put like uh, little mini wetlands or floating wetlands um, or little ponds um, at the edges of fields to trap runoff before it gets into, into the rivers, right? And if you just slow the, the, uh, the period of time that the water is moving, a long enough oxygen will, bacteria will take the oxygen out and then, and then remove, start removing that nitrate. So, um, so that's one example. Um, they, at Wakwik Bay, they did some tests where uh, it was a really, a really cool experiment. They basically dug a giant trench in the beach and they filled it full of wood chips and then they just closed it back up. And it, why would that work, right? But, but if you think about it, you've got groundwater, that's a groundwater fed system. So you have groundwater that's flowing into the estuary it emerges really close to, um, the, to the beach, like it comes really close to the surface of the ground near the beach and goes and, and, and moves through this, this giant thing of wood chips. And what those wood chips provide is a source of carbon, a slowly decomposing source of carbon for the bacteria, right? It's food. And so they're adding food, promoting the bacteria that can take the nitrate out of the water. And then, and then the nitrate that's coming out of that, of that barrier, um, that has, has much lower nitrate in it. And so I mean, that's a really cool way of, of filtering out the nitrogen, but it requires that you bring a bulldozer in and dig a giant hole in your beach, which most people are not really all that willing to do. Um, so, so there are, but I mean, a lot of our waste treatment, I mean, different tertiary waste treatment um, systems rely on different, um, different processes to remove this nitrogen. So they'll, they'll it, it, most, most, nitrogen waste is in that ammonium form. And so they will, um, they'll put it in a giant aerator and they'll give it tons of oxygen and turn it all into nitrate. And then they'll put it into a giant anaerobic egg chamber and then they'll let that become nitrogen gas. So, so they use that to help as a way to help remove nitrogen. So there are lots of engineering strategies that kind of take advantage of this. Um, on a local level, you know, you might just put a teaspoon of sugar down your, down your, I'm kidding, uh, <laughs> down your toilet every time you go, but that's probably not going to be effective. Um, we do have another question in the chat on, on a bit of a more general level here. Um, the question is, have you experienced a lot of pushback on your research because you're suggesting a, a change to the status quo? Um, and, and, you know, we all know that that usually comes with some pushback from folks who might be profiting or otherwise benefiting from, you know, the existing processes? Um, I haven't, I, you know, I haven't really received a lot of pushback. I mean, we are very careful to, um, to, you know, as I said, the, you know, there are implications and caveats to this. And, and I don't think that anything that, that we are um, talking about is revolutionary by any means. I just think that, you know, we, we don't often, you know, Lots of people are thinking about carbon storage and lots of people are thinking about nutrient removal and these different roles that marshes play. And, and we, we don't often think about them together and understanding how one might affect the other. And that's where I think, and this is why, you know, really what I do day in and day out is sit and stare at the genomes of microbes because it's when you start looking at these processes together in an organism, what are they actually doing? How are they making a living? that you can draw these connections. Oh wait, if they're doing this, then that means this is what they must be doing with the carbon. And this is good for this, but not great for that. And so, you know, really kind of, um, so, so, so really my research is more just reminding people to, that, that we have to think more holistically than we sort of typically think when we look at like, I just focus on my, my nitrogen removal and I just focus on my carbon storage. Um, without those two worlds coming together. So I'm just trying to bring them together a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, and, 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 and remind people that we need to think about both, um, both, at, both, both sides of, of what these metabolisms are doing, not just the one part of the reaction that we think is interesting. Great, Yvonne? Um, yeah, I could keep throwing questions at you, but I, I don't want to keep everyone here all night. I do have, um, so it seems like, I did have another question actually about sediment. Um, when you were going over all these experiments, um, 
do you, did you come across any work that was done looking at the density of sediment and differences in the capacity of the microbes to fix the nitrogen? Um, with regard to density, um, in so much as density correlates with organic matter content, yes. Um, so uh, there are sediments that have the, the different na nature. Of, so let me back up. Um, within a salt marsh, um, really the, the differences in, in um, sediment structure are, are really from sort of old carbon that has been picked over for a long time and is no longer very desirable to bacteria to sort of freshly label, freshly uh, available organic matter from leaking out of roots and from recently dead plants and microbes at the surface, right? Um, but, but there's not a lot of difference in terms of um, sediment uh, content, sediment density, that, that sort of thing through that, through that column in the marsh itself, um, especially when you're talking about like in the marsh peat. Uh, if you go into the, into the creeks, then uh, things definitely change. And um, the, the, there's a lot of complex chemistry around, um, you know, clay particles and, and the different chemistries associated with what binds to clay and what doesn't bind to clay and how much the sediment compacts. How, and so the more dense the sediment, the more it can compact. Um, generally, the less organic matter there is there, which means the less like um, energy there is, or the less organic matter there is to support microbial growth. Um, but mostly in these systems, we're talking about such organic rich sediments that, that we tend to not have that issue um, as much as you do sort of in, in systems that are not nearly as organic as organic rich. And even, um, you know, the marshes up here in New England are really different than marshes um, in the southern part of the country. Um, we're doing a big comparison between what's happening in Plum Island Sound and what's happening in the Georgia marshes because um, the Georgia marshes are, have, m they're much more mineral, the sediments are much thicker and much, are much um, denser. Um, and so these processes, we have, a, we have a big proposal in right now to compare and contrast these processes in those two systems with super organic rich systems and much less organic rich systems. So that's a great question. One more question just came in. Yeah, <clears throat> we've got, did your research team look at benthic diatoms? Um, as Eugene recalls, Van Ralt only found minor changes in the benthic diatom biomass and species composition in Sipawisset with sludge addition. That's absolutely right. Uh, yeah. So um, we, I, I have, it's funny, you know, it's one of those things like this, the fertilization experiment in Plum Island um, has been going on since 2004. I started working on it when I was a postdoc um, in, 2000, in, in 2005. And then I went away for a while. And when I came back and started my faculty job, I was at UMass before I went to Northeastern. I mean, when I started my faculty job at UMass, I started working on this project again, um, and I've been working on it pretty much ever since. Um, and uh, so we haven't measured benthic diatoms directly, but we have measured and monitored benthic chlorophyll in permanent transects in all of the different habitats in all of these different, um, in, in the reference and fertilized marshes up in Plum Island. And it's one of those measurements that just sort of sat, you know, we always had it, but nobody ever did anything with it. And so, um, as we've had to move internships to virtual spaces, uh, we, I had an intern who was like, you got any data I can analyze? I'm like, we have years of benthic chlorophyll data, have at it. <laughs> um, and so we're really just starting to look at these trends in what happened with benthic chlorophyll as a result of this nutrient enrichment. And they're consistent with, um, uh, um, with Charlene's results, which are that, he, that you, um, you don't see a huge impact of of nutrient addition on benthic chlorophyll. And there are a couple of possible reasons, and we've done a little bit of work trying to tease this apart. And we're, we, I have an intern this summer who may be trying to do a little bit more of this, but um, the, the, there's sort of one of two things, depending on where in the marsh you are. It could be that, um, you know, there's enough shading that, that the benthic diatoms are light limited in a lot of the, in a lot of the marsh. So in Peyton's and, and in the really densely vegetated tall spartina, especially towards the end of the season, um, you may, it may be a light limitation thing. Could also, of course, be a grazing thing, right? Benthic chlorophyll measures a standing stock. It doesn't measure a flux. And so 
And so it could be that that those those benthic diatoms are growing like crazy, but just as fast as they're growing, they're getting eaten by snails and other amphipods and nisopods and things that eat benthic diatoms. And we don't know which of those two things it is explicitly. Um, Although we, we have not seen a, a big shift in, uh, in the food web. So, um, we, you know, if that, if that benthic diet, if those benthic diatoms were a huge source of food, then you would expect to see ramifications of that up the food web, which we don't see um, in, in those systems. So it's a little bit of a mystery, but we do have some data that we've been playing around with trying to disentangle that. Thank you so much, Jen. This is a really hot topic. And um, it you, you did such a wonderful job getting into some real details. Uh, <laughs> I hope I didn't overwhelm you. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I, I think other people did as well because um, we had a nice crew of people hanging out for the whole talk. And I, oh, there is another question, but I just, before Leo facilitates this last question, I think that will probably be our last one. Um, I did want to say, so in a nutshell, to me, what I'm taking away from this is, um, you know, the plants take up ammonium or, or nitrate, the microbes can use, um, can use it as well, but when they really oxid or when they really use it to respire to a great extent, they also then decrease the stored carbon quite a bit in, okay. So to me, I just wanted to sort of, yeah, they can. Say that's what I'm walking away with. Right. And, you know, the question, I, and I think the open question is how much, you know, and so we like to say, you know, there, I don't want, I don't want people to walk away with the idea that, that like, you're going to go out one day and your marshes are going to be gone because the bacteria just started chomping away at it. Right. But what it, so the way that we, that, that we're careful to phrase this is that, that they may be decreasing this carbon storage capacity of the marsh, right? So as you fix new carbon, if there's a lot of nitrate around, maybe they're chewing through more of that and less of it is getting, is getting stored. So it's not just that, that all of a sudden they're gonna go and start chomping up on all of this 2000 years of marsh accretion. Um, we don't think that that's what's gonna happen, but, but when they do use that nitrate, they are able to decompose carbon that may otherwise have been stored. And I think that's the take home message. We have a question and a chat comment, and then I think we'll probably let you go, but I, uh, yeah. Great, here's our last question for you, Jen. Um, do you or did you consult with indigenous communities on researching the ecosystems? as we have a, a audience member who suspects that they would have um, some long-term observations on the development of the salt marshes in New England? That's a really great, great question. And um, this is something that we've been talking about a lot um, with up at the Plum Island uh, LTER, um, where a lot of this research has taken place. Um, you know, those, those lands um, were, were uh, obviously uh, important fishing grounds for native um, communities that used to uh, live up in the rivers and then migrate down to the coasts to fish during, um, during the summers. And, um, and the people who are the leadership at the LTER are, are, um, are, have, have within the last couple of years started trying to reconnect with the, with the groups of, of, um, of Native Americans who, who originally populated that area. Um, but, and um, one, one uh, member of our team in particular, uh, Robert Buxbaum, he uh, has done a lot of work um, like studying it, uh, early uses of the marsh. So for example, from, um, uh, from salt marsh haying and that kind of thing. And so he's really leading um, that, that effort. Great, thank you. Excellent, well, thank you all so much for your attention. Um, it was fun to chat. Hopefully I can actually come out and do this in person sometime. That would be wonderful to actually see who you all are. <laughs> um, thank, thank you so much, Jen. This was really uh, very enjoyable and informative. Yes, expect an invitation to come down as soon as we can bring you down for a live <laughs> talk and a follow-up. Um, there are so many other topics I know that your lab also works on, including oysters, which um, is a, another topic very 
related to what we have going on down here in a couple of spots. So yeah, I have um, a new grad student joining me in the fall who's all in on understanding oysters and trace gas fluxes and yeah, so so we'll be happy to come talk about oysters too. Excellent. Yeah, we look forward to a follow up and continued conversation about this theme. Um, it's it is really important and interesting. And um, thanks again. Uh, and thank you everyone who joined us and for asking questions um, and uh, look for another Marsh related uh, talk in two weeks on, on April 8th, I believe it is Thursday night in about two weeks. We're, we'll, you'll see an announcement coming out prior to that, but we'll have Michael Roy and Mark Hensel together doing a talk on their work in Folgers Marsh. Um, Mark, uh, yeah, well, you'll hear about it when we do that talk. So thank you, everyone, and um, have a good evening, and we'll see you later. Thanks so much, everyone.